Hi, and welcome. My name is Dan Murphy. I'm the managing director of the, here at the Broadway Rose Theater Company, where we are coming to you live from our new stage. Uh, so welcome to Midday Cabaret. It's been a couple of months since we've done it, but uh, we have a special edition. We call them uh, Midday Cabaret Cast Editions. So uh, we're thrilled to be able to pick this up again. Uh, of course, we want to thank our title corporate sponsor, Pearson Financial, for their many, many, many years of support, at 25 and counting. And we thank Conrad Pearson, Bonnie Conger, and everybody over at Pearson for all of their efforts in keeping us, keeping us around. So, and today's uh, event, uh, special broadcast, that we're doing, uh, we're going to meet the two actors from The Story of My Life, which is the current show that we are now streaming. So we're thrilled to have them, both Alec Cameron Lugo and Andrew Wade. So uh, before we do, I want to remind you, though, if you do have any questions for either Alec or Andrew, that you can go ahead and submit those questions. And then later on in the broadcast, we'll have an opportunity to uh, ask them. Um, so with that, would you please welcome Alec Cameron Lugo. We'll start with him. So hello, Alec. Thanks for being here. Hi there. How are you I, doing? I'm good. How are you, Dan? Good, good. Thanks. Good. Um, so we're going to start with where did you grow up, just as we get to know you a little bit more. Sure. Um, well, I, I sort of uh, have grown up not all over the place, but I divide my life up into sort of thirds. I was born and <laughs> I was born and uh, I lived up until I was 10 in San Diego, California, Southern California area. We moved sort of um, mm -hmm. in that area. And then when I was about 10, 11, we decided to up and move to Hawaii of all places. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my parents just sort of wanted to get out of the, um, you know, the sort of craziness that is the Southern California area, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of go somewhere a little different. And Hawaii is, is a little different um, than most places in the United States or even the world. Um, and, uh, and I lived there through middle school, high school. And then once I graduated, uh, I went to, I decided to go to college here in Oregon and wow. I went to Pacific University and I sort of bounced back and forth between home, you know, on the breaks and then uh, coming back to Oregon, and then I officially sort of moved into Portland proper about four years ago, and I've been here ever since. Wow. Yeah. So so tell me this then. How old were you when you started performing? When did you get bitten by the bug? Oh, well, it's funny. Um, the first play I ever saw was when I was sort of still in California. My mom went to go take me to see Little Shop of Horrors, um, okay. and as a kid, uh, I was terrified. They just had very, <laughs> very realistic props for the end of Act One, and it was just very, very scarring. Um, but when I moved to Hawaii, my mom took me again to see another play, Romeo and Juliet. Very mm -hmm. lovely, very beautiful, very classic. And then the next show that I saw immediately after that was Little Shop of Horrors at the production there um, at the local community theater, which was the uh, the Aloha Theater or mm -hmm. the Aloha Performing Arts Company at the time. And then I uh, my uh, my interest was piqued and I told my dad, I want to do that. I want to do whatever they're doing. And so I auditioned and uh, for my very first show, A Christmas Carol. And I got in as Bob Cratchit, and it was sort of all a downhill slide from there. I did as much as I could, whenever I could. Um, my school didn't have a, a very robust arts program in in um, in that way, and so I kind of just did whatever I could at the theater. Um, I was in shows mostly. I was an actor, mm -hmm. but I also did backstage work, tech tech work. And when I was in my junior and senior year, I was doing I was working on every single show at the community theater. Um, up until I, I graduated high school. Wow. So then another change of scene, you come here to Forest Grove, which is pretty far away from Honolulu. <laughs> and uh, so by being up here, what what was the degree? Were you after a theater degree or? Yeah, I I sort of knew right up and right up up until my senior year of high school that doing theater was was the thing was what I wanted to do. And I had to sort of broach that conversation with my dad. He agreed. Um, but I did go to school at Pacific University in Forest Grove, where I got two degrees. I got a degree in uh, theater performance, and I also got a degree in film and media production. Um, wow. So I did the double major thing, which mm -hmm. not for everybody, but I managed it. Um, <laughs> and uh, got out of there uh, with, uh, with uh, two arts degrees. And uh, wow. yeah. That's great. And then you, of course, 
you're here in Portland, you stayed. You didn't go back to Hawaii or Southern California, although you have family in both places. Mm -hmm. um, so remaining here in Portland, then you hit the the Portland theater scene running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I, I tried I tried pretty quickly right out of college to sort of get that work going. Mm -hmm. um, the first job I ever, my first sort of professional acting job I ever got was with Bag and Baggage Productions out in Hillsboro. I was in a production of uh, their their show Rope um, uh, by Patrick Hamilton. I played a small mm -hmm. part, but it was my first time ever getting paid to act. So I mean, uh -huh. how can you complain, right? right, um, right. And that was that started a really great relationship with that company. And then after after I that was when I was still in school. I was still a senior mm -hmm. in college. And then after that, I graduated moved to the city proper and started auditioning, started trying to get work. Um, and I was also, I had also learned marketing and graphic design skills. So I kind of was able to make some freelance gigs work for about the first okay. year that I lived here. And then I started getting more and more work consistently as an actor, very fortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, kind of threw together a budget uh, for sure. myself. <laughs> um, and then eventually I actually, uh, applied for a job with Bag and Baggage Productions wow. as uh, a marketing assistant. Uh, that mm -hmm. was about a year after I had lived in Portland. And then uh, I got I landed that job. I'd actually done some graphic work for them earlier, and then they wanted me to be the marketing assistant. And then I continued working with them, and I applied for their marketing manager position, got promoted to that. And now that's where I am now. I'm the marketing Great. manager for the first the company that first ever decided to pay me to do uh, theater work. <laughs> oh, good. Full circle. Well, some of the other performances that people may have seen you in here in Portland, you, of course, down at Northwest Children's Theater played Bert in uh, yeah. Mary Poppins. Oh, so fun. And then Anonymous Theater, the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Mm -hmm. um, and Oregon Children's Theater, The Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Yep. And, of course, Fuse Theater Company, where I think you may be sitting on the board, or I know you have a big affiliation with them. Yeah, as a, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an ensemble member there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and had done cabaret with mm -hmm. them yeah. over there. Yeah, so I've, yeah. I've, 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 I've been really lucky to work with a lot of really great theater companies mm -hmm. here. Um, and Why, do a thank really, you. A, <laughs> I was getting to that, Dan. Would you give Would you give me a second? <laughs> okay. You got You got to build it up. Um, <laughs> and and done some roles that I I'm just really fortunate to have done. Like probably my favorite role that I've ever done so far has probably been Bert in Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. Just such a sure. great cast, such a great show. Oh, um, had such a learned so many cool things, met so many wonderful people. Okay. Um, and well, yes, you, Broadway Rose. I and well, you came to you. us in 2019 mm -hmm. in our production of Into the Woods. So yeah. what, was, what was that like? Uh, oh, oh, there I am. Look at, <laughs> look at him, the little yellow suit and that big bouffant. Oh, so, oh my goodness. I'm having flashbacks, um, trying to put that thing on. It was such a fun show. That was the first time I had ever done Into the Woods. I know that it's sort of a, I guess you can call it maybe like a rite of passage of doing like one of those sort of larger Sondheim musicals, but that was my first time I'd ever done it. And it was so unique uh, in the way that it was produced, the way that it was mm -hmm. performed. It was on your it was on your main stage there. So it was, it was this right. huge show sort of on a smaller stage. And I, I was not super familiar with the show outside of the sort of main cast of characters. So when I was mm -hmm. like, play the steward, I'm like, I don't even know who this guy is. Um, but he's a small but mighty part. And I got to meet a lot of really wonderful, fun people through that show. And, yeah. um, and of course, I had been dying to work with Broadway Rose for a while ever since I got into town. You know, I had, I had seen shows there and I had known people who had been working there and I was just dying to get in oh, in, a, in in your theater company and try to do something there okay well check it off your list because <laughs> you're here um hey so then this summer of course the pandemic hits and everything shuts down but we were fortunate enough to be able to do uh to co-produce with uh, all classical portland the radio station the they took the sherlock holmes in the west end horror stage play and they adapted it for the radio so you played a multitude of characters oh, in that oh show, but that was strictly a recording, which is was a little bit more than just a staged reading because, mm -hmm. you know, how, how was that experience for you? Uh, well, you know, it was that, I guess you could call it voiceover work, right? Mm -hmm. Like that mm -hmm. was sort of the first time I had ever broached doing um, any sort of uh, voiceover work. And it's different, you know, you're, you're acting exclusively with your instrument here. Um, and you don't, you know, you, you kind of just have to focus on that. But I mean, it's really, it's really easy and fun when you have such a great fun script to work with and you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're just 
at that point, right, I had been dying to want to do more work because many of us are sort of not being, right. not having the opportunity to do that right now. So yeah. the creative, yeah. like the moment you step in there and read the script, the creative juices just come flowing back and you just get really into it and excited. And, yeah. and, and how can you, I got to play Oscar Wilde. So how can you not have a lot of fun with that, <laughs> right? Well, and among other characters too, because, mm. you know, you did a great job with Thank you. changing it all up. Uh, and then, of course, along with the pandemic, you were able to do Northwest Children's Theater production of Susical. Yeah. And that, was, oh. that was one of the first people to, I think, produce anything at that capacity. Oh, look at him. He's so cute. <laughs> uh, yes, Northwest Children's Theater produced Susical back in, well, it ran in June, but we produced it all through like April, May. Um, and that was that was right about the pandemic sort of hit and we mm -hmm. all were quarantined and not really knowing anything by the time March happened. And then we were we were like, uh, is Susical going to happen? We're not sure. So many people were on pins and needles about that. But the creative folks over at Northwest Children's Theater said, we're going to do it digital. And mm -hmm. they they came up with a plan for it. And they made costumes and set pieces. We filmed it all in our homes separately um, and, you know, sung all of our own parts on the track and mixed them and they mixed them all together. And it was the first sort of thing that was sort of large thing that was created, I think, at least maybe here in in Portland, but certainly for me, the first large thing I had yeah. done in the pandemic time. And it was so fun. Horton has always been a dream role. And I was so <laughs> glad to get to do it, even even at, you know what, actually, especially in that capacity. That was so memorable. Good, good. Yeah, that was one of the first ones out of the gate, I think, in the Portland area. So mm -hmm. kudos to Northwest Children's Theater. Um, and then, of course, the story of my life. You're back here at the Broadway Rose. It's streaming now through the 28th. Um, but that was, uh, had you ever heard of the show before we, we did it? Uh, no, uh, I had not. Um, it was, it's kind of surprising because, um, I, I kind of feel like I, I gravitate towards smaller shows like this, um, where it's, you know, sort of more intimate settings or they're not sort of larger, you know, I love, I love the big, I love a big musical. I love mm -hmm. it. Um, but I had never heard of it before. And it was bizarre that it was like an on Broadway show. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I personally have never done a show of this size. I've never done a show with just two people in it. Yeah. And I've never done a musical where I've had, I mean, I've done leads before, but certainly having to carry so, like so much yeah, of a show yeah. with only a singular other person to sort of go yeah. off of. Um, I mean, it works great for a pandemic setting. You have only maybe five people yeah. in the room, but um, it's a way, it's a very different yeah. experience. Hey, and the other thing you did with your, maybe part of your film background is you were able to do that um, co-op on the IFC. What was, yeah. what was the title of that again? The, that uh... was uh, Documentary Now's Original Cast Album co-op um and uh, i was lucky enough to get to be a part of that it was a it's a it's a documentary now is a tv series created by fred armison a few other creative funny folks um same guys who did portlandia um and it makes fun of and creates mockumentaries out of famous documentaries that exist out there so <laughs> this one was based on the very famous original cast album company sondheim uh recording and uh and uh, they were looking for local talent because they were filming here and there was a lot of unions here advocating to cast locally for some of the um, under five parts and things like that. So I submitted some videos, didn't hear back anything for a little bit. And then eventually they came back and they said, we'd love to cast local and we'd love you to come in. And then I did it, didn't hear anything for 10 days. Of course, you know, film has such a tight turnaround. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the biggest and probably the only film thing I've, I've, I had done up to that point. And they, you know, they said, we'd love to cast you. We film in two days. And I'm like, I had to get time off work. Um, and the funny story about that is I was so, I was so busy and kind of out of it at the time that I thought I was just kind of going in for an extra part. Like I was going to be in the background or I was going to be walking through the, you know, the, you know, the set or something like that. But no, I get to the rehearsal that day and there's like maybe 12 of us and I'm Great. not real, and I'm not really paying attention still. And like they go in and they say, "Okay, we're gonna start singing. Uh, we're gonna rehearse these numbers." Uh, Alex, would you actually pre please um, uh, do your numbers so that we can just hear it? And Renee, would you do your number two? And I have no, I, I'm not reading any of these names. I'm not do. I don't know where I am. I don't know what's. I'm just nervous, kind of, for the most part. And then the voices start singing, and I like look up from my music stand, and I'm like, "That's 
that's Renee Elise Goldsberry. I'm standing in a room with Renee Elise Goldsberry and Alex Brightman. I, 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 I sort of had a mini panic attack. I was like, I had no idea what I was stepping into, but I, I, was, I got to be on set with Richard Kind Very and cool. Paula Pell. It's so many cool people. So yeah, yeah. that, that if, if I only ever do one TV or film thing in my life, I'm happy that, that, that it's that. Good, good. Hey, so let's get to some singing. Yeah. So would you go ahead and set up this song and then hit it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, this song is called Disappearing. It's from a musical uh, called The Pursuit of Happiness. And uh, this is not a musical that has premiered yet. It was one that was slated to happen in um, uh, this last summer uh, with Fuse Theater Ensemble. It's written by Ernie LaJoy. And uh, we had sort of recorded some of these numbers already and so i've sung this song a couple times but it, i would be originating the part and i have originated this song it was written sort of with me in mind and in the context of thinking about story of my life the ways in which we sort of affect each other and things affect us inadvertently to make the decision to kind of move on and move forward um and and you know allow yourself to live and um feel okay and maybe not knowing or not having control over certain things. That's kind of what the, the message of the song is about. Um, so I would love to be able to play it for you. Uh, and here we go. We were 16 years old in a park, in a clearing of trees. We were young and alive and afraid, hoping nobody sees. tense. Suddenly everything all making sense. You and I face to face with my back to the fence and the fit of your coat and the shape of your chin and the lump in my throat and the tone of your skin and your hand on my back and the slowing of time and my limbs going slack feeling like I'm disappearing, disappearing for that one perfect moment of life when the doubt helps, melts away. Disappearing. in my life, I thought, I'll be okay. We were 16 years old in a park, in a clearing of trees. When the hate and the hurt of this world cut us off at the knees. Suddenly voices both angry and tense, suddenly nothing at all making sense. You and I facing them with our backs to the fence, and it turns on a dime with the tear in your coat, and the stopping of time, and the hand on my throat, and the boot on my back, and the blood on my chin, and my world going black where I truly disappearing, 
disappearing when the hate and the hurt in this world is too much to be faced disappearing in the clearing thinking maybe it's better if people like me are erased So they send you away where you pray that you're healed and the lies become truth and the truth is concealed and that part of yourself by the fence in the field well he never stood up and he never moved on he just fades out of you until one day he's gone till this pillar of lies that you're standing upon all comes crashing down all around and you find yourself back in the park by the fence on the ground at the scene of a crime of a brutal attack where you're frozen in time with the boot on your back and the blood on your coat and the tear in your skin and the hand on your throat but it's time to begin reappearing reappearing and start clearing away all those decades of doubt and unease reappearing in the clearing when I open my eyes and I see that it's time to stand up But a part of me might always be Just 16 years old in a park In a clearing of trees Wow, that's really beautiful. Really it's a lovely. Beautiful. It's a really, it's a really yeah, lovely it is. song. Yeah, it is. That Ernie LaJoy is talented. He contributed to "It Should Have Been You," one of my favorite shows. So it was nice. Thank you for doing that. I'm sure he'll. So love we're that. going to now bring out Andrew. So we're going to put you backstage and bring out Andrew, and you'll join us a little bit later. So I'm thrilled to bring Andrew Wade to you. He plays Alvin Kelby in our production of um, "The Story of My Life." Forgot for a second. The story of my life streaming now through the 28th. So please welcome Andrew Wade. Hey, Hello, how Andrew. You doing, how are you? Good. Good, good. good. Now, you are coming to us from North Carolina, Peggy Taphorn's Theater, the Temple Theater in Sanford. What are you doing down there? That is correct. Um, well, my wife and I live here now. We moved out of New York at the beginning of this pandemic, and we're over at Temple Theater. Uh, for a few weeks, putting together a little Valentine's Day cabaret-style uh, performance for Great. for a very small number of live audience members and uh, for streaming as well, just like Story of My Life. Great. And they can probably get more information at the Temple Theater for mm -hmm. all of us friends of Peggy and company. Um, <clears throat> but you are not from North Carolina or New York. You actually grew up here in the Portland area. Where specifically? I did, yes. Uh, we moved to Milwaukee in mm -hmm. my second grade year, and I was, I was raised there for through through college. I I lived in the Portland metro area. Um, actually, grew up in the house that my father grew up in in Milwaukee. Oh. Wow, wow. So when were you then bitten by the bug, shall we say? Yes. Uh, well, I grew up in a somewhat performance-based family, I guess. N not professionally, but my mother danced and she was a gymnast in college and my dad was in choir in college, all that kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we grew up uh, singing at church and, and doing all the um, grade school programs, the Christmas programs and spring programs and, and all those things. So I always enjoyed uh, singing, but I didn't start doing 
acting and, and, and shows until call, uh, not college, high school rather, at LaSalle mm-hmm. High School um, under the direction of Ernie Cachado. Oh, sure. Um, back in the day. And mm-hmm. uh, I started in doing the non-musicals because I was a avid baseball player um, in my youth. And that was in the spring, which is when we did the musicals at LaSalle. So my f- freshman year, I tried to do both, couldn't do both did baseball. It was, the, it was the love of my life, the passion <laughs> of my life. Um, but junior year rolled around, and they were doing My Fair Lady, and I watched the movie version with my family, mm-hmm. and I thought to myself, gosh, I really like that song, On the Street Where You Live. I'd like to sing that song. So I decided to audition, and I said to myself, if I get cast as Freddie Einsford Hill, then I will do the musical. But if I don't, then I'll stay playing baseball because it just wasn't meant to be. So I <laughs> went in to do all the auditions. I had never sung in front of people before, you know, in, in that capacity, sure. um, in, in like a judgment capacity, if that makes sense, where you're going <laughs> in and you got to, you know, you get basically told whether you were, you were good enough or not to do it, you know. Um, but I took voice lessons for the first time leading up to that, did a little bit of acting lessons with an actor, a friend of my dad's, and, and uh, went in to sing for the audition and sang on the street where you live and i was so nervous it was it was <laughs> awful oh it was so nerve-wracking my knees were shaking the whole time i was up on stage couldn't i knew they were shaking i was like can you stop can you stop shaking and they would not just kept shaking the whole time like a leaf um but got through it got through it and uh then later that day i got a, a note at the end of the day saying that i had to go to a to a callback and i didn't know what that was and I was like, what's, what's that little, little freshman Bobby Novi came running in and said, Mr. C wants to see you, you for a callback because me and another guy were up for the part, a friend of mine. Um, and I didn't know what that was. And I thought, I have to do this all over again? I have to do this again? Not really realizing that was like a good thing to be wanting <laughs> to be seen again, you know? Um, but uh, did it again. He said, can you sing it a little more like Mel Torme? And I said, I don't know who that is, but sure. And... So- <laughs> So I'm pretty sure I sang it exactly the same, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, ultimately uh, they, I did end up being cast as Freddie Einsford Hill. Um, oh, yep, there he is, fresh-faced in the, in the uh, boater hat. Um, and and uh, that was my first musical that I did, and it gave me a lot of confidence, honestly, moving forward. Um, from a vocal perspective, I also started an acapella group at that at that time with a couple of the other guys that were in in the show, and that really helped build my confidence in a mm-hmm. from a performance performance perspective. Yeah. I did go back to play baseball senior year, though. You did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Um, did you then uh, in going to college? You went to University of Portland. What did you pursue there then at college? I, yeah, I studied music. Mm-hmm. Um, music performance and and specifically vocal performance as the focus uh and it was interesting because the the theater and music departments didn't really cross over much at the time there um but they did do musicals every other year so Mm -hmm. i did one musical while i was at the university of portland my freshman year i did sweet charity playing vittorio vidal the uh italian (laughs) you know fabio as it were not exactly typecast, but you know, there weren't a lot of a lot of music students. So, um, but I did work with Mox Crest Productions in the in the summers mm-hmm. when Roger Doyle was was heading right. that. He was he was the head of our music department, and he he and Tracy Edson kind of right. ran it back in whenever that was two thousand five to nine. I was doing that. Oh, good! You did it every year during college. Yeah, yeah. We oh, great. that's all for those who don't know. That's all Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes. or operettas mm-hmm. at the time mm-hmm. they may have branched out since then but that's all they yeah. did at the time yeah so then that is so then you graduated and you didn't stick around you went down to los angeles that's correct yes yeah. uh less than a year after graduation um a friend of mine who was moving down who maybe someone knows david rubin is his name and he's from the lake oswego area um he was moving down to pursue screenwriting and was I think mostly looking for someone to know down there, you know, and really <laughs> just kept, <laughs> kept pestering me to uh, to move down. Um, and uh, eventually I said, yes, okay, fine, I'll do it. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like he was twisting my arm, but 
it wasn't, I didn't necessarily have a plan to do that. You know, I didn't necessarily have a big plan for my life. I was never someone who was like, I have to be on Broadway. If I don't mm-hmm. make it on Broadway, mm-hmm. I'm nothing. I'm not one of those people. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I did. And, and, and I told my parents two weeks before I left. And that went over about <laughs> as you would think it would. Oh. Um, but uh, I did it. And, and um, you know, it was probably the best thing I could have done at the time, you know, yeah. moving into the world as a, as a young adult. Well, it's very funny to move to a big city and say, would you please move with me so I know somebody there? <laughs> it's a very l- light premise for mm-hmm. moving. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so when you were down there, that's when we discovered you. We didn't know you here at the Broadway Rose Correct. up here, but we were casting West Side Story. And so you had done a submission. So what was, had you heard of us before you left or? Yeah, certainly I'd heard of Broadway Rose, though I hadn't even seen, you know, I was on the east side and Broadway Rose was on the west side. So you know how it goes. (laughs) But um, I know, you know, I'd never made it down there. I'd seen some stuff at Lakewood um, that my younger brother had been a part of. And I'd also seen Ernie Cachado do uh, Man of La Mancha with with Mm -hmm. Leif Norby. Sure. Many sure. years ago there um, while I was in high school. But I'd never seen anything at, at Broadway Rose. Um, but while I was performing down in the Southern California area, I met Ron Dom, which no doubt many of mm-hmm. you all are familiar with. Um, mm-hmm. And he, we were doing a staged reading of 1776 together at the Candlelight Pavilion in Claremont, California. Uh, and he was playing John Adams, and I was the courier, you know, mm-hmm. classic. And uh, so... A few weeks later, I actually don't remember how long, how much later it was, but it had to be at least somewhat close in time Mm -hmm. for him Mm -hmm. to have thought of me. But uh, I got a message from him on Facebook saying, hey, Broadway Rose is looking for a Tony still. They've got they've got it basically cast, but they, they haven't been able to find a Tony for West Side Story. Would you be interested? And I thought, well, yeah, sure. And, you know. Luckily, that one, it was in my spam folder. I just happened to check <laughs> that week the spam folder, and, and it happened right. to be there. So it was, it was very fortuitous, and I said I'd certainly love to be considered. Um, yeah, go ahead and put me in touch. And, you know, I, I think it was you or, or maybe Alan, might have been Alan, reached out with the um, – materials and said hey can mm-hmm. you record these mm-hmm. things and just send them up to us and i yeah. did and and the rest is history and yeah I, yeah yeah, oh, yeah that so was a... young <laughs> well that was a great production that we did that was for our 25th anniversary we did that there you are with mia panero mm-hmm. and that of course is where you met peggy taphorn who was the director of the show and although you eventually um, went to go work for her Look at that. So much emotion. Oh, yeah, there you are, emoting. Maria! <laughs> That's acting. <laughs> That's acting. Um, so then, but before you uh, went down to Peggy's, uh, you did Cruise Line for a mm-hmm. while. Tell me a little bit about the Cruise Line. Where did you go on the cruise? Yeah, so um, right after West Side Story, I had, I had booked a, a uh, performance opportunity on a cruise line called Aida Cruise Lines, which is a German-based cruise mm. company. So it's it's for German clientele. So it's a German-speaking mm. uh, German speaking vessels, and then they hire, you know, people from all over. But the, the main crew is German-speaking, and all the passengers mm. are German-speaking. Do you uh, speak so German? I didn't at the time, but no. I did learn while I was while I was there, and I really loved the language. And I actually almost moved to Germany uh, um, in order to pursue musical theater there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we we would rehearse in Hamburg uh, for somewhere between six and eight weeks at a time before each contract, and then mm-hmm. depending on the itinerary, you know, you'd get on the sea. And and I did uh, primarily European. Mm-hmm. Uh, itineraries a lot of mediterranean you know italy and and yeah. spain and portugal yeah. and france and uh then wow. in the north sea as well yeah. out of britain and, and netherlands and we'd go out to islands here and there we did the canary islands and the azores and i even got to casablanca at one point went to ricks <laughs> you know right right well then you eventually made your way back to the temple theater in sanford north carolina mm-hmm. yes so what, uh, what were you doing there well, uh, Peggy called or emailed or whatever the case may be while I was on 
uh, one of my cruise contracts and said, hey, we're doing a production of Ghost the Musical. Um, if you're interested, I'd love to have you uh, for Carl. And I was like, okay. I mean, I, I hadn't, I didn't have anything scheduled. I was coming off the cruise contract and then I thought I'd probably do another one if I didn't book anything, you know, before that. Um, so I said, sure, I'd love to, uh, you know, it's not every day that this, you know, all American blonde hair, blue eye guy gets to play the bad guy. So <laughs> that's always pretty fun. You know, that's some of my favorite roles have been those, you know, the dentist and little shop or, or those, those sort of, uh, evil yeah. characters as it were. Well, had we been able to do the wedding singer, uh, mm -hmm. this summer, we had cast you in the not so likable guy. That's right. So that's right. That's right. I I'm guess starting you're growing to, into it. That's right. I'm starting <laughs> to get a hang, a hang of it. Um, but yeah, so I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, I mean, I'm not doing anything else and I loved working with Peggy and I'm always happy to, to go have a new experience, you know, at a new theater. Mm -hmm. And so I came to Sanford, North Carolina and I walked in the door to the cast house and there was my future wife. <laughs> standing right there and the angels sang and right. uh she um, didn't know it at the time but oh she knew no. in her heart <laughs> she knew um, that's great that's but great. yeah and so i met my wife there uh doing that show so really mm -hmm. i would never have met my wife if it hadn't been for you guys you know if you You're really welcome. think about it yeah. <laughs> yeah well after that you and Haley went back up to new york after yes um, yeah she was living in new york at the time so mm -hmm. i uh changed my plane ticket from Germany to New York, canceled, or uh, I hadn't signed a contract yet, but told the cruise company I wasn't going to be able to do the next contract. And I went to New York instead and, and uh, tried my, tried my luck there mm -hmm. um, with her. And, and you were um, touring. Um, eventually you got another touring gig. Tell us a little yeah, bit about did, that. Yeah, I did a couple of things. Uh, I worked on Jersey Boys for a minute and then I did an off-Broadway, The Office, the musical parody, which was a lot of fun. And eventually uh, started a national tour of a show called The Simon and Garfunkel Story, mm -hmm. which is basically um, a concert style show about their music and their lives. And I went, as you can see, and got an awesome perm <laughs> and uh, played Art Garfunkel. There we are, me and George. Uh, and it, it's a blast. It's, it's such a fun <laughs> show. It's, it's just the music is so wonderful. And and the the group of guys is is was just such a blessing to work with these yeah. you know it's it's a small it's a small group we have a four piece band and it's then me and George you know Art and mm -hmm. Paul and mm -hmm. uh, then we got three three tech guys in the background and that's it and we yeah, we do wow. um, you know one nighters and we do week two week three week sit downs and it's Ooh, just great. a great group to be a part of and yeah. and a lot of yeah. fun. So that was obviously suspended with the pandemic, but you were here and available, lucky us, to do the story of my life. Had you ever heard of the show before? I had not. Um, I looked you. into it. Yeah, I looked into it when when you sent me the email <clears throat> with the information. And, you know, like Alex said earlier, I was surprised to find that it had been a, a show on Broadway. And, and after reading it, thought, huh that's really great that it had that opportunity because in my brain, it kind of seemed a little more intimate, a little more like mm -hmm. a, an off Broadway mm -hmm. one act kind of thing. Um, but obviously what that says about it is that the message is really universal and really mm -hmm. wonderful. And, and when it's done well, that it, that it really brings the audience in yeah. and creates yeah. that sentimentality for, yeah. because, because I don't think you get to Broadway with a show that's built like this without such a powerful message. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to bring Alec back in a little bit, but in the meantime, we'd love to hear a song from you. So why don't yes. you go ahead and set it up and take it away. Awesome. So this song is from a show called Bridges. Maybe I was a little too far away from the mic. This song is, a, is from a show called Bridges of Madison County. And I'm going to accompany myself on guitar. It's So for those of you who know the film, there was a film, Bridges of Madison County, uh, with Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep. And the basic concept is that Clint Eastwood plays this uh, photographer for National Geographic and he meets this woman um, whose husband and kids are out of town and they you know have this flirtatious relationship uh, while they're gone but ultimately they you know they don't end up together obviously um, but he sings this song about her and the love and that he felt in those moments and, and the, the um, connection that he felt with her 
Uh, and this is actually a song that I sing a lot for auditions. So my watch is talking to me. So I sing this a lot for auditions. It's, it's a song I love. And so here we go. There was something in a desert. There was some place wild and green. And a child in a village I passed through. There are places that I've traveled. And so many things I've seen. And it all fades away. But you I was sliding down a mountain I was burning in the sun I was crying with amazement at the view I was capturing the moment but when all is said and done well it all fades away but you it all I have sailed across the oceans, past the cities and the fars, on a never-ending quest for something new. But the only thing that mattered were those four days in your arms, cause it all fades away. But It all fades away 
Wow, thank you. That was just great. Wow, Absolutely. what a voice. Um, so now we're going to bring Alec back. We're going to talk a little bit about the show. Um, hello, welcome back, Alec. Uh, so how you guys um, in the rehearsal process is usually pretty fast around here, but it was also a rehearsal process um, for the cameras. So what was this like to rehearse this show as opposed to the other shows where you know you're going to perform in front of a live audience? Uh, well, it's... You know, it's an interesting um, concept going into it. Obviously, it's it's very different to not have a full live audience um, responding to the show in the way that you traditionally share that experience with an audience, the energy that you give and you receive back. So from that perspective, I think it was definitely different. Um, I think that was the, the biggest difference for me anyway. Uh, from a performance perspective, the way that, that Sharon directed it was, was very much still theatrical rather than um, like for film or television. And so it was still be because the idea was to be able to view it like it is live theater from mm -hmm. home rather than like you were watching a filmed special on television or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So from an acting perspective, it was for me, it, I mean, Alec may have had a different feeling, but I, I, I felt more or less like it was is pretty much the same from in the size of, of movements and, and, and the way that you're creating the character. The the big difference was the um, lack of a full audience. And then every, you know, here and there, Sharon would say, hey, it's just so we're creating pictures for the film for the for the cameras. So just make sure your focus is over here at this moment mm -hmm. or over there at that at that moment. Um, but there wasn't a ton of that. It was it was pretty. Yeah, yeah. pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree. You know, you ever you ever have those moments where the uh, technician walks in and said, okay, this is the day we're going to do archival filming. And sometimes you get a little bit of butterflies in your stomach about just like, what have I been doing on stage? Like, what are they going to capture and is going to be there in perpetuity? Um, but we had had that in mind throughout the whole process. So, right. um, you know, it, it was kind of just like a, a small elephant in the room, not yeah, necessarily anything that was, you know, yeah. beyond recreating the process yeah knowing it was going to happen you weren't as intimidated when the cameras came into to the room yeah sure to do it yeah wow yeah um well we have a couple of photographs we're going to show um but while we do that um have either of you watched the show yet uh i have i have yeah. gotten a chance to watch the show um and you know it's uh uh, I mean, I think we're all going, a lot of us who are primarily stage actors are going through that um, process of being like, oh, is that what I'm doing? Is that what I sound like? Is that what I, where did that mole come from? You know, or whatever, you know, I don't, I've never seen that before. Um, but, you know, the more and more you, you sit with it, the more and more you kind of get comfortable mm -hmm. um, ex experiencing that that is kind of the beauty of live theater yeah. is that it is kind of that, um, you will never you you know the reason we I love theater is because you walk in and you that show is going to be yours. It's never going to be exactly that same way right, right. any any other time. And I think that we do get to capture that moment. So if I yeah. kind of think about it in that way, I yeah. I I get to enjoy it a lot more. Yeah, and Andrew, you're waiting for Valentine's Day, Andrew, to watch exactly. It? Yes, Valentine's Day date night. Um, <laughs> wow. No, okay. uh, I mean, yeah, we're waiting to be be back home basically because yeah. um, we're right. in Sanford right now, but. Uh, and have it on the big screen, you know, and, wow. and take a look. It's it's always weird watching yourself mm -hmm. as a as a stage actor, just because you never do, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it teaches you a lot about about yourself and and kind of what your quirks are, and and we all have them. Um, but I think that that we're all really proud of of the product that we put out on this yeah. this show, you know, the the b because. Um, we don't get into an extended run because we we get bas we had basically one week, you know, four days of, of kind of filming and really just two that were like the gung ho filming, the ones. filming yep. days. <laughs> um, I mean, Alec and I talked about this after the, our final filming day that, you know, normally when you have a rehearsal process that's like two or three weeks, you know, for me, I love two to three week rehearsal processes. But what that means is then in kind of the second week of run or third week of run, you're you're finding even more stuff that's really fun and and really nailing down the the making it in your body and second nature. And so you're not thinking at all anymore and you're just going going by um, by muscle memory and creating these characters, whereas this is like we have to do it 
yeah. here. And yeah. I and and we were just I mean, I am and I know Alec was too, that we we're just so thankful um, and grateful that we were able to put this together and, and create a, a production and put one show together that we were so proud of to put, put that last right. show together. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the promo video. Everything is starting, Alvin. Everything is real. Make your angel right over here. The snow is just ideal. If only for a moment, we'll have perfect angel twins. Thank you for the fine demonstration. Now move out the way. This might be the most inspiration you have felt all day. That's the ancient art of creation. Proudly on display, and here's where it begins. I think we have a little bit of time left to be able to, oh, and Tyreen Bata, first question. I hope my question is asked. I can't wait for the answers. Okay, Tyreen, here you go. Welcome to our special edition of Midday Cabaret. Uh, here's Tyreen. Okay, if this show was a meal, what would it be? Really, Tyreen, you want uh, this question asked? Um, if the show was a meal, what would it be? What kind of beverage would you recommend? I'd love to hear what Alec and Andrew would serve. Okay, boys, what would you? Hmm. I would serve chicken parmesan over fettuccine Alfredo with an Imperial IPA. Wow. Okay, Alec. That's, that's so interesting because I actually had like a, a screening with my friend and I made a dinner for myself that I thought would be appropriate. And what I made was uh, ribs <laughs> with, uh, I, with, with my brother's homemade barbecue sauce that, okay. he, that he got me for the holidays. <laughs> and I also made homemade, uh, homemade mashed potatoes, peas, and I had it with a whiskey ginger ale. Wow. So here's the thing, Tyreen. You're going to have to get Alex brothers barbecue sauce it's very important thing it's really sentimental it. it's the sentimentality <laughs> store store bought is. is if you can't get if you can't get brother made store bought is fine joyful and sentimental that's the kind right. of meal you want to yeah. enjoy dinner and a show okay Absolutely. we have time for one more question and what is this one and it is from jeffrey knapp when things get back to normal what lessons will you carry from the covid days hmm. so i think um I think the biggest thing that I'll take away that maybe I guess it's kind of a lesson is is just to be regularly joyful and grateful to be on stage um, because I've I've done some things that are virtual as well and it's just not the same for me mm-hmm. as as having that uh, live theatrical experience that you get to just open yourself up and share yourself with a bunch of mostly strangers you know and and they <laughs> they open back up and give right back to you and it's such a communal um experience such a communal experience and i think that that is what i miss most about it and and mm-hmm. i think just that gratitude and joy is mm-hmm. is the lesson that i'll take away is not not to let that that get put to the, on the back burner yeah, yeah. how yeah. about you alec andrew I'll, i i'll second you on that one just you know there's so many times where i think i feel like i've taken for granted the sort of really that I'm that I'm in a in a career in a in a place that I love to be and that I love what I do um, and that I love it every day even if I don't get to do it um, and I miss it you know like we you and I and 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 everyone who's had the opportunity to to do these shows has been very fortunate and I know that for many of us we're just prevented from doing that work right now and it's hard um, and you know I I'm I'm just grateful that it happened. Um, and and I know that I'm going to carry that gratefulness into when I do every night of any show that I love doing because I'm doing something I love. Yeah, right. and I would say also just where there's a will, there's a way. I Absolutely. mean, you guys, this is the fourth show that you guys have put on this yeah. way, right? Yeah. So it can be done if you have the desire and the, and the drive to make it happen and that's what you really need or want to do. You can do it regardless okay. of what it is, really. Yeah. So. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It's been a delight. Um, I hope that you enjoy the show, Andrew. I know Alec did. And, uh, and so stay safe and be well. And we'll look for you again here at the Broadway Rose. Thanks. Absolutely. Can't wait. Yep. Well, folks, that is our show this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. 
Um, please know that the story of my life is run is streaming through the 28th. So you can go to our website to uh, get some tickets or you can call the box office. They'll be ready to take your order and explain to you exactly how easy it is to stream it right into your home. So we hope you enjoy it. We thank you again to Pearson Financial for their many years of support and enjoy the show. And I look forward to seeing you in the lobby as soon as we can. <laughs>